Now that the new cases of this pandemic are going down and the vaccine is available for those who want it, many of the companies that were closed are opening back up now and they're hiring for new positions or they're filling old positions. And it's during times like this that employers are desperate to just fill those roles that you have the best chance of getting your foot in the door and getting your first job in a technology field. And in this video, I'm going to go over some ways to increase your chances of getting hired. Now, I'm gonna keep things really general in this video, uh, but there are, of course, other things that you can do to increase your chances, depending on the specific field that you wanna go in. Uh, do you wanna be a programmer, network engineer, security analyst, etc.? cetera? Um, but let's get into it. So first, we wanna understand the job market because the way that things really work uh, was never really explained to me in school. I don't know if they're telling people these days, but you got to understand the system to thrive in it. So the first thing you need to know is that jobs don't just get offered to whoever is the most qualified. It's not quite a strict meritocracy. Um, I think things might be better if they were that way, but it just isn't. One of the driving forces behind hiring decisions is kind of like a form of nepotism. It's basically having connections. Uh, knowing someone who already works there at that company, um, maybe they were a past colleague, maybe they went to the same school as you, maybe they're even people from the same town or people who served in the same branch of the military, uh, people who you met at a convention, so on and so forth. But ultimately, the most important skill for getting a job in tech is actually your social skills. And I know that that can be a little bit tough, especially for people with tech-minded brains, because we tend to be a little bit more antisocial. But, um, you know, try to befriend more people, especially if they have the kind of job that you want, because that will greatly increase your chances of getting it. Maybe they go into a new position or maybe they quit that job and go to work for a different company and they can sort of tell their boss, hey, you know, hire this guy for my position that I'm leaving. Uh, try to go to tech conventions if you're in a large city. There's probably uh, several meetups, hackathons, um, things like that uh, that take place every year in your city if you're in a large city. Um, and they're usually free to go to as well. So um, you can find them on sites like meetup.com. So like if we take a look for within 25 miles of Boston, there's all types of different things they're doing. So there's, uh, well, most of them are still virtual meetups, but hey, it's, you know, just as good. Or if you can't go to an in-person one, it's uh, better than nothing. So database professionals, um, there's AWS meetup, Python user group. Um, you get the idea. Golang, there's all types of different tech meetups in big cities. If you're in school, try to be friendly with the professors because they might know somebody in the industry that's looking for fresh talent. Uh, in some cases, the professors might have actually worked in the industry themselves and they might still have relationships with that employer. Uh, go to job fairs that your school has. Usually schools have job fairs where recruiters and people that are representing the company are literally looking for people to work at that company. Uh, make friends with the right students on campus. So people who are actually career driven, who might already be interning or working part time at a good company. And then when that converts to full time, maybe you can get their intern position or maybe they could just put in a good word uh, once you both graduate for that employer to go and hire you. If you're working a wagey job, try to be friendly to your customers, especially if they look like someone that might be a hiring manager. That's actually how I got my first office job. I was about 18 years old working out at Dunkin' Donuts and one of the regulars was a lady who was actually the president of this property management company. And on a slower day that she came in, we got to talking. I had a small amount of experience with property management just because my dad was a landlord for one of his friend's houses that was being rented out. Uh, her company happened to be hiring at the time. And what do you know? I got hired for an internship two weeks later, and then that converted to a full-time job after six months that I was able to do for a little while. Uh, no prior experience besides basically just helping my dad with some maintenance work and then actually uh, typing up the lease terms into a document. Uh, but yeah, eventually the company did go under um, after a couple of years. But 
At the time, the pay and the day-to-day -day work, that was a hell of a lot better than just serving people coffee and donuts. Um, and that actually reminds me of another thing that you need to figure out, which is the business strategy of the company that you want to work at. More specifically, what is the time scale of their business strategy? Because this is going to determine uh, roughly how long you're gonna work at a place and the kind of employees that they're looking for. So these days, most tech startups are not really looking to become a Fortune 500 company. Um, their strategy is generally to become, well, generally to build some kind of a product, get it working just well enough to take the business public and then sell the business to a bigger company like Google or Microsoft. So if you find yourself working at a company like this, the business strategy, it might take five to 10 years for it to fully play out, which uh, that's really more kind of a job and not a career. So something to think about, especially if you're going to move for a job like this. Uh, and that's assuming that the startup survives its full life cycle. Most of them fail before then, uh, but there's always that sort of small, like mega millions lottery ticket chance that uh, you might join the right one at the right time and then make a lot of money, especially if you're able to get some sort of stock or equity options. Um, now, another thing to keep in mind is the culture of a company. So if you like things to be really on the fly by the seat of your pants, you know, some weeks you might be really busy and then other weeks you're just not at all, then a startup might be better for you. If you like things to be uh, really structured and really routine, then try to work for a company that's been in business for a long time. Um, now let's talk about resume building and how to get your resume seen. So what you need to understand is that the first two or three people that are going to look at your resume, they probably are not technically literate. All right, you might give your resume to a recruiter and they usually have pretty general tech knowledge. Um, usually it's just enough to know if somebody is blowing smoke up their ass because they might be a recruiter for many different kinds of businesses, for you know businesses that are going to be running databases, uh, some that are looking for full stack developers, some that are looking for network engineers, maybe security analysts. So they their knowledge is going to be really wide, but it's probably not going to be super deep on those various subjects. Or if you submit your resume directly to a company, it might get screened by an actual bot first. Um, and I'll talk about how to get past that a little bit in a moment. Uh, then your resume, it goes to a person in human resources who probably knows even less about tech than your recruiter. So if you are lacking experience for your dream job, uh, maybe you want to be a database admin, go ahead and fill that resume up with whatever technical experience you have, even if it's only slightly relevant. Okay, it's better to just have something on there. And in the meantime, get more experience. One of the great things about the tech field is how cheap it is to get experience. Uh, generally, it'll really only cost you your time and no money because so much of the infrastructure involved is free and open. Uh, like if you want to be a software developer, you can literally start today, uh, download a language that you're interested in learning, uh, start reading up on the libraries and best practices for your language, uh, or maybe you want to be a network administrator. If you have a little bit of money, you can go to a place like Best Buy, or I think uh, maybe Walmart might sell some network switches too. So you can buy something like that and try to configure it in your house and then you know maybe return it if you don't actually have a real use for it. Um, but you pretty much get your money back and now you can actually say on your resume, hey, I configured a network switch. If you're looking to be a developer, start playing with whatever programming language is popular right now, or if you know a little bit about different languages, the one that you actually want to use. Uh, go ahead and create a GitHub. Uh, contribute to open source projects or start your own. Doesn't matter how simple it is, just have something on there and boom, now you're a developer who has a GitHub that employers can actually look at um, to see how good your skills actually are because they can actually take a look at your code. Um, they can roughly see you know, how long it took you to write up and they can run it on their own computer. So it's a little bit better or it gives them a little bit more uh, technical insight into your skills rather than you just telling them and potentially blowing smoke up their ass. If you wanna get a job working with Linux in some way, you can just install it and start using Linux to get experience with it. 
read the manuals, read release notes of all the technology you're gonna be working with, learn the general information about new frameworks. Uh, one of the best things that you can actually do during an interview is demonstrate right then and there that you know something that will help a project that that company has going on. Maybe you were reading about a new feature that was added to a framework uh, that the company happens to be using, and the hiring manager says, oh, we're looking to add in X functionality. You can tell them, oh yeah, that functionality just got added into this latest version, and you, know, you can pretty much do that uh, easily with this library. And if you're able to solve problems right there at the interview desk, they're going to be rushing to hire you. Um, also, a lot of the uh, educational info about tech related fields is also free. So personally, uh, I went and got a few CompTIA certifications, which do cost money to take the exam, but getting the knowledge was free. So I actually use this YouTube channel here. Uh, Professor Messer, he does video lectures for uh, like A plus, Security plus. Um, he doesn't do any CCNA stuff, but pretty much he's got uh, the CompTIA stuff covered. Um, and then the textbooks are usually available at public libraries, so you could go and get those, or you can download the PDFs for free usually. Um, if the book just came out, it might take a little while for that to be available, but usually these exams are good for years and years, so you can usually get the reading material for free as well. Uh, and then like I said, it only costs a little bit of money to take the exam. Um, same thing with uh, like MIT's OpenCourseWare, and there's another thing that Harvard has, which I can't remember the name of it just now, but uh, I'm sure there's several schools that are doing this, where basically they just record their video lectures um, for like usually an entire semester or something like that, and then they just upload them to YouTube for free. Um, they're a Creative Commons license, and in a lot of ways, they're actually better than sitting there in a lecture because obviously in a live lecture, you can't pause a professor, you can't adjust the volume, uh, you can't rewind or double their speed if they talk really slow. Uh, so yeah, this is actually really good. And um, talking about the way to get past the screening bots. So th this is just sort of weird anecdotal evidence, but uh, back when I was looking for a job, I had my certifications listed, my experience and everything like that as soon as I got it, but I wasn't getting a whole lot of interviews at first, like maybe one or two a week. Uh, and then I was doing, I was actually in the middle of doing MIT's open courseware, and then I had finished all the video lectures, uh, and they have some um, uh, materials on their website that you can do that goes along with it. So I just listed on my resume that I finished that, right? Didn't say that I have like a degree from MIT or anything like that, just that I, um, basically the name MIT got mentioned in there. And I think that that gets flagged by um, these uh, screening bots or whatever, and then sends it through because it's like, oh, look, we saw MIT or we saw Harvard, so it looks really good. Um, just obviously, whenever you're talking to a real human being at the companies, don't like pretend to have a degree if you don't. Uh, it's pretty easy to figure out if someone's lying about a degree and that's not going to get you the job. So there you go. There's some tips to get you started with your career in tech. Um, and some resources that you can use that maybe you didn't know about. There's definitely some other things that you can do. Maybe I'll cover some of those in a part two or just talk about my career history a bit and basically uh, all of the processes that I went through. Uh, but try what I talked about in this short video and I guarantee that you're going to see some results.